Welcome back to the weekly market analysis, the week ending April 21st, 2023. Welcome back to the channel. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Mr. J Thomason, and you can also follow my free weekly Substack. Uh, comes out on Sunday mornings weekly, um, and this is at befinanciallyfree.substack.com. Um, you can find the links for both my Twitter and my Substack in the description below, and I would encourage you to follow me and subscribe. Um, and you can get all of this, uh, all of the research that I do for myself uh, for free. And um, I want to take a minute and start off here with the, the first question. Now today, what I want to, I'm asking two questions. Uh, the first and foremost question is, uh, is this the beginning of a stock market correction? And then secondarily is uh, with the FOMC meeting coming up in uh, a little over a week on May, I believe that is the, let me think, that is the, the second and third. Um, is the Fed hiking, pausing, or cutting? Um, and let's and we'll take a look at uh, some other things regarding the Fed. And I want to start off. Um, maybe we'll start with the second question first, since I'm sitting here on my three-month yield chart. Um, and if you've been following me on Twitter, you know I've been making a big deal out of this. I would like to start off by saying, uh, as of right now, the market is uh, whatever people say about the ten-year uh, or the two-year, uh, whatever people say about the euro dollar. Um, I could tell you with certainty that as things are right now, the Fed will hike another 25 basis points. And I know this by watching the three month treasury yield. Um, the three month treasury yield without fail tracks what the expected, uh, what the near term ex uh, expected Fed funds rate will be. Um, and you could uh, put that up if you're on trading view. Um, oh, by the way, uh, right now the yield is at 5.114%. So when it's in between uh, a range so that they, the Fed hikes in, uh, they, the Fed has um, quarter point ranges. Uh, and so like right now, the, the, the federal funds rate is at 4.75 to 5.0%. Um, and so uh, it's got the kind of a quarter percent range. And so when, you, when you're seeing the three month yield right now between 5% and 5.25%, um, then that is, showing you that right now the market expects there to be a 25 basis points of uh, hiking still. Uh, so if you're on a trading view chart, you pull up US 03 MY, and that's the three month treasury yield. And then you add, uh, you can add on to it the uh, US INTR, uh, which is the uh, US interest rate that's going to capture uh, part of the Fed funds rate. Um, and then you put in EFFR, and that's going to put in the uh, effective federal funds rate. Uh, and so what I like to do is uh, I like to add those uh, to my chart, and then I'm going to combine them all. And uh, what you see from that is um, uh, what you see from this chart uh, is that the interest rate policy, you could see that some of it, one of those tracks a lower bound and then the other tracks the upper bound. So uh, when you're looking at uh, at this chart, and I, I could put these uh, these indicators, the symbol names up just so you could see it clearly. US INTR always tracks the upper uh, bound of the Fed funds uh, rate um, rates and then EFFR kind of shows you where the the rate currently is sitting where, where the effective rate currently is. So that's usually actually somewhere in between. And that's why when you look at the dot plot and you see, oh, what they're expecting the Fed funds rate to be at 5.1% by the uh, end of 2023. Um, that's the higher for longer argument. Uh, and so what you see by looking at this uh, when, is when you track this all the way back, um, you can see uh, that as the three-month yield rises, the Fed funds rate follows it. Um, and uh, on not, not on every occasion, but on many occasions, um, you actually see that the uh, Fed funds rate will come up and touch the where the price is uh, on the yield. Um, and, and another thing, another way I could uh, illustrate this to you is to go back. And this is, this is kind of to the, uh, there are a lot of people on Twitter who are talking about the Fed pausing. 
um, or that they're going to pause on this and they're actually not going to hike. And what I want to show you is that the last time we had a pause, we're going into late 2018, early 2019. And so what you see is that um, after the last rate hike, uh, which uh, was in December, I think it was December 19th of 2018, you see that last hike, uh, what you notice is that, uh, so the next uh, meeting would have been in late January, um, and uh, what you see is the, the three month just goes sideways. And so that's the market signaling that the Fed was going to pause. Um, and granted too, like, I mean, you, you notice that it was going sideways already. Um, it never uh, it never went up beyond 2.5%, which is what you would have been looking for. So by the time early January came and Powell signaled that they were going to uh, you know, pause rate hikes, um, in between that time, the, the three month never actually uh, went up. And so I just want to want to call that out because a lot of all the people who are out there saying um, that the Fed is going to uh, pause here without raising rates um, doesn't really understand. Um, you can follow the three month treasury curve uh, to figure that out. So I do want to call that out. Um, out. Uh, and then another uh, thing has been coming up about Fed liquidity. And I'm going to, in order to do this, I'm going to show you uh, the charts that I make uh, for uh, the Fed balance sheet. So um, the best way to track the Fed balance sheet is uh, to uh, basically look at Fed holdings of U.S. Treasuries and agency MBS. And the reason why is because uh, when it comes to QE, actual QE, uh, rather than just looking at the balance sheet, um, overall like total assets uh, which includes emergency lending and things like that you can look at it uh, in terms of uh, what actually amounts to QE which, or real QE which is USTs and agency MBS and you can see that the that basically since the uh, Fed started QT uh, it has been slowly dropping off now most people when they look they're looking up the Fred chart that you can see of the central bank balance sheet and it shows that little spike over on the top right uh, and that's because of emergency lending. And that is reflective of this chart where if you take the Fed balance sheet and you subtract USTs and MBS, then you can see the spikes in emergency lending that takes place. So this is not, uh, this is the non-QE uh, aspects of the Fed balance sheet. And you could see that um, after our little peak here that we had uh, after the banking crisis started to subside, we've been declining. Uh, week over week uh, for the last couple of weeks. Um, and so a lot of that liquidity is disappearing from the market. And then, of course, we're post-tax day now. And so uh, you're going to see uh, tax receipts have an effect. And usually there's a little bit of a spike on the TGA, the Treasury General account, which sucks liquidity out of the market, um, usually post-tax day. So that's going to be something um, that we want to watch for uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but for now, uh, markets have been kind of going sideways, um, and I have been, let me uh, erase, uh, let me get rid of these drawings for just a minute, um, and I have been uh, on the record on Twitter as saying that I think what's happening here is that this rally has been, has already, you know, had its course, and that all of this sideways action is actually, uh, there. I think somebody is creating a market, or maybe a lot of institutions and large investors are creating a market because um, a lot of people you know the, the average and uh, you know especially retail the average investor doesn't get in on the bottoms they get in after the moves have happened and so I think now once you got the higher low um, in and then you had the higher high the higher low and then you're coming up close people are catching attention you're getting you know all the news all of the discussion about uh, you know, China liquidity, Japan liquidity, you're getting the discussion about, you know, the Fed pausing and pivoting. Um, you have discussion about rates and stuff like that. Um, amidst all of this, there's been a lot of it, what, from my view, there's been a lot of excitement about markets going up. Um, and what's been interesting is to see that there have been a number of instances where markets have traded down substantially and then come up. Um, and yet, in, even in spite of all of this, the S&P hasn't made uh, a new high um, and uh, compared to its February high. Um, the breadth of the market is not there. Um, and, uh, you know, even you have the NASDAQ, which 
recovered uh, quite a bit today to finish positive and it was down pretty far. Uh, you can see it hasn't made, uh, I mean, it, it made a new high compared to February, but um, it, it's not it's not going up higher than its March 31st closing high. Um, so we're just kind of edging sideways. A lot of people are uh, are tempted to uh, to look at this formation as they're going to say, oh, that's a bull flag. Uh, and, and it might be, but um, I think that because you're seeing breadth go away, uh, in the market, I think that what's happening is that this is this rally is fizzling out, and it's uh, it's. I think that people are offloading here, um, and I think that we're going to see a correction. Um, one of the reasons that I think that is if you actually track global liquidity, and I apologize, this has to load. I thought it was already loaded up. Uh, if you track global liquidity, uh, which you can do uh, through a particularly complicated process. Um, yeah, uh, this is a there's a, a bunch of different li different global liquidity charts that um, that are out there. Uh, the one that I'm looking at is uh, is also adjusting some some only look at the you know U.S. liquidity and then subtract like the Treasury general account, uh, general account and the reverse repo. But I actually take uh, on top of that I'm taking the uh, assets also from the Chinese Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the ECB as well, and um, and then uh, making this composite liquidity chart. And uh, what you get is if you actually look closely at the developments that have been taking place, uh, you could see it has tracked like the S&P, which is the white line here on this chart. The S&P has pretty much tracked liquidity pretty well. Um, so when liquidity started going sideways, in all of these instances, at when liquidity goes sideways or up, that has given uh, the S&P an impulse to rise, as well as Bitcoin, which is the orange line here. Um, except the difference is that uh, obviously you had um, uh, the FTX blow up, uh, which brought uh, crypto down uh, further, but, but it had been tracking uh, the same direction along with liquidity kind of improving a little bit. Um, and what you've been seeing is a divergence. Uh, if you look on the right side of the chart here, um, you can see the, the orange line and the white line have been increasing. Um, and, uh, and, and then now at the same time as that has been increasing, the blue line, which is the liquidity uh, metric, is actually trending downward. And so there's been this divergence. And so I actually expect uh, this to come down uh, to come down towards the uh, to the liquidity line um, and that level right now is would put S&P at just under about 3960 uh, and Bitcoin at about 24,000 maybe a little bit less than 24,000 um, and so uh, I'm expecting a correction to take place uh, for those reasons as well so you've got uh, you've got breadth decreasing uh, the breadth that is going out of the market um, you also have uh, and I don't think I have it up here but if you I've been tracking this a little bit one one thing that you could do anybody can do this you don't have to have a subscription to do this you can go to morningstar.com uh, and click the market tab um, and then find uh, whoops I'm sorry this isn't loading yet um, yeah and then when the this page loads you click Morningstar and you can actually see defensives uh, have been uh, are leading and um, defensives were leading quite a bit last week um, and then for a couple of days into this week the cyclicals were taking over but we've seen kind of the resurgence in defensives um, and so I do want to call that out typically when defensives are leading that's a sign that uh, that there is some risk uh, that uh, market participants are positioning against they tend to want to go to the safer sectors uh, when there's going to be a downturn if they have to be um, allocated so that's another reason that I mentioned obviously the the liquidity um, if you uh, bring the side by sides up on the uh, on the market so I have this uh, this chart that I'm pulling up that has a couple of my uh, metrics pulled up um, and looking at a uh, both a weekly and a daily and we bring up the uh, the S&P 500 let me just get that up here really quick sorry about the slow load uh, what you can actually see is our MACD which is this middle t uh, if you look on the right panel and then go to um, one of the lower uh, tabs here um, you can actually see that uh, let me see if I can pull this up a little bit it's gonna mess it up sorry you can see that we're actually on the MACD trending down 
Um, and on the daily here, um, and by the way, this MACD is custom. It's not it, it's not the normal preloaded MACD with the normal settings. It's a it's a custom setting. So uh, when this MACD on the daily time frame crosses to red, um, then that's usually been the sign that we're going to see a correction. And it's happened uh, basically every time, uh, you know, for a while. Um, depend no matter how far back you go, uh, all of 2022 it showed. Um, and so I, I want to call that out uh, because I think um, right now there are a lot of people who are getting excited about upside. A lot of people are taking positions uh, as markets have been going sideways. And to me, there's just a lot of warning signs. Um, so uh, let's take a look uh, at a couple of the other markets. You see the NASDAQ here uh, again sideways. Um, the Dow has been kind of struggling ever since uh, it made its little high uh, back in December. Um, it has failed to make a higher high ever since. Um, you have the Russell, which has had something of a small sideways recovery, um, but is is not. There's no strength underneath the Russell, um, and I do want to call that out. Um, on the U.S. dollar index, you can see here it looks. It kind of looks like a double bottom, uh, but you know, a double bottom with a with fake breakdowns both directions. Um, can't really tell. There's no no reason to get really excited about the dollar moving to the upside, um, unless you make a higher high and can then make a, a higher low. But I will say, um, and I posted on Twitter about this that, um, you know, there's people that I know that are talking about news stories. These and, and these people are people who are not in the financial markets at all. They're not doing any research. These are just your average, ordinary people, and they're talking about. You know the death of the dollar. I had a, a relative call me recently, uh, asking me if I heard about BRICS and how the dollar is going to stop being used as the reserve currency. And to me, that's you know. And, and by the way, that call, that phone call was I think somewhere right around here in this area. Uh, and so you know that this is you know th that's probably in my opinion uh, a bottoming signal. Um, you know, and then you're seeing all these different people who have been uh, dollar bearish, uh, basically this whole way. Remember, remember all the people who, basically since the the lows in 2021 of the dollar and throughout this whole move, were kept kept saying, "Oh, the dollar is going to roll over. And it's going to go down." And and don't forget, if you've been following me on this channel uh, and on Twitter, then you've you've known that I've been a dollar bull since October 21, or I had been. And then if you go on my Twitter, uh, my pinned tweet up here is from September 23rd, just a few days before the uh, before the dollar top, or actually, uh, yeah, just a few days before the dollar top. Um, and I don't remember if I've ever shared this, but on Tuesday the 27th of September, I got a DM from somebody on Twitter who suggested that I might be right about the dollar. And here I was talking about the dollar could continue to go higher and higher, and somebody who has been vehemently disagreeing with me about the dollar for some time messaged me and said that they thought I might be right. And that should have been the best top signal ever. Uh, so here, I kind of feel the same way because basically everyone's written off the dollar. I could totally see this going up and making a higher high, uh, higher swing high, I should say. So I want to call that out. Uh, briefly looking at the 10 year, I uh, had a little bit of, uh, of a rally here. Um, and what I think is interesting is uh, we had this trend line that I called out a while back. Um, we broke below it. Um, I believe I made it one of the, the last video that I made, which was on uh, April uh, 6th, I believe. Uh, we broke below it. We actually came back above. Uh, and so I'm going to keep that line there. Um, I think the, the what markets have been expecting is that yields are going to continue to go down. And I think it's entirely possible that yields may go uh, back up to the swing high from March of this year. Uh, do want to? I, I think everybody should be prepared for that. And remember, if not for the banking crisis that took place, uh, yields were heading closer up back to their previous highs. Um, and so, uh, who if who you know who knows what might have been if not for the banking situation? Um, anyway, um, and then let me take a look at. Oops, that's the futures chart. I'm going to take a look at Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, is signaling correction as well. Uh, Bitcoin is overdone. If I pull up, uh, not overdone, it, it was overbought, and I did signal that uh, in my newsletter, uh, my weekly newsletter, actually. If I go to, I don't remember which issue it was. Uh, it might have been issue 52. 
I know I'm doing this in real time, my apologies. But I do want to look and see. Uh, nope, it wasn't there, so it must have been my uh, most recent one, which would be even more convenient because it was timely. Uh, so let me scroll down here. Um, in my uh, Bitcoin, I put overbought, uh, and I signaled the exhaustion. I, I showed the exhaustion signals, and I showed that it pierced the upper boundary uh, of the probable range, and uh, and obviously we've been pulling back uh, ever since then. Um, so uh, I want to call that out. So I, the newsletter was published right here Sunday morning, uh, and we were right up there. And price has come down. Uh, obviously, I'm not I'm, I'm not here jumping for joy like oh Bitcoin is crashing. I'm not saying that, but Bitcoin's down 10% since then. So I I, I will self promote a little bit there, um, and Bitcoin is down today as I'm recording this. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, let me go to the side by, not this one, the side by side here. Uh, if I click on uh, Bitcoin, then what I want to signal to you is a lot of people are going to say, oh, like Bitcoin's oversold. It's, uh, it's going to bounce from here. And it might, it, it, it might. Uh, one, one way to signal that would be uh, if you look at like the, the very short term oscillators, um, we are in, uh, we just pierced oversold. Um, to me, the better signal is the orange line. Uh, I want to see that get into oversold territory. And then once, uh, typically when I look at this signal, I look at for when the uh, when the orange line crosses back out of the oversold region. That's typically the best spot. And if you look here, uh, that would have been a really great signal as it was preparing to cross out. Um, I've got a lot of signals that would have suggested that at the banking crisis, that was a time to buy. Uh, but that's beside the point. Uh, because the orange line is not there yet in oversold, um, then I don't see any reason to think that this is going to bounce anytime soon. Uh, and then another difference is uh, that uh, if you look, um, we're not close to oversold yet on the RSI. Uh, and so, um, so I do want to uh, call that out. Um, we have still a lot of room to go down here. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to call out on Bitcoin uh, and I, I'm getting really into the weeds here on some of these indicators, but I, I'm trying to show you how right now you should not expect a bounce uh, in Bitcoin. I think this is going to correct further. Um, you can actually see, oh, I, I, meant to, I meant to have the MACD expanded here. If you look on the MACD, you, get, you can see a clear bearish divergence on the daily MACD. Um, so we made the higher high in price, but very much lower low on the, uh, on the MACD uh, histogram. Um, and so as soon as you saw this uh, this bar turn lighter green, which signals a decline. That would have been the place to sell, uh, and so um, I took that as a, uh, as a signal to like, hey, like watch out with your Bitcoin positions. Um, and so uh, even Bitcoin is signaling a market correction. Uh, let me go back to my main charts. Um, gold, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of flack for suggesting that you should sell back in March right here. Um, you know, price did kick back up. This was uh, the spot, right? Uh, what was it? It was right here, Wednesday, March 22nd. I posted on Twitter saying this was your opportunity to sell again. And honestly, I will say I was expecting price to come off right then uh, and correct. Uh, price did come back up, but price is actually uh, upon close this week is below the level uh, from which I actually sold my gold position that I was holding. Um, I actually sold it on Monday, uh, March 23rd, um, and then uh, I posted on the 21st, or I'm sorry, on the 22nd of March saying, hey, this was your second opportunity. So uh, it remains to be seen. I know a lot of people are expecting, oh, gold's going to go make all-time highs. They think it's going to make all-time highs tomorrow. Uh, obviously, tomorrow's Saturday, so I don't literally mean tomorrow. But most people on, like, I, I think gold has become a consensus trade because as I've watched uh, videos on YouTube and listened to podcasts from a lot of big uh, macro people, um, they're all talking about, oh, yeah, gold is, you know, gold's going to make new all-time highs this year. Gold's going up. And I think it's now become consensus, so I'm fading this, honestly. Um, I don't think that this is going to go up and make all-time highs now. I think it will on the other side of whenever we get the recession. I think that's when we're going to get... Uh, gold to finally go up and make all-time highs, but not before then. That's my opinion. I'm willing to eat that if uh, if it's wrong. Uh, and then finally, crude oil. I suggested back here on Monday, April 23rd, when price popped up, I suggested when price was still trading near the top uh, that this might actually be a, a short opportunity. Um, 
and uh, in my most recent, uh, in, a, in a newsletter that I posted, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, and also last week I mentioned that this was shorting territory because if I turn back on my tide signal here, um, you can see that uh, price, uh, the, the colored line is below the gray line. Um, and when price is on the opposite side of that gray line from the colored line, that's usually a short signal. Uh, and so we have sold off quite a bit since then. Um, but, uh, but it remains to be seen. Um, again, with the backdrop that a recession may be coming, I'm not really sure uh, where oil is going to go here. So um, I, my rule is I don't take longs unless they're super like exhausted, like you see with these green arrows. Um, or if the, 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 the colored line is on the, up, on the top side of the gray line. Uh, and price pulls back into it. That's the that's my rule personally. So in this case, I will not be taking uh, long crude positions. Um, I'm still expecting that this is going to come off a little bit further. Um, so we will definitely see uh, about that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to take a look at really quick uh, with you guys was some economic data. Um, I want to show you the conference board economic indices. Uh, we're, uh, we're trending, interestingly, we're trending worse um, in the leading economic index. That's in the right side panel, uh, this first set of bars. Um, and then on the lagging economic index on the right panel and the right side set of bars, uh, we're now at a place where on a compounding sequential three-month annualized basis, uh, we're trending at zero. So that means that uh, it doesn't mean that growth is going to be zero, but it means that the, the lagging index is suggesting there won't be uh, it won't go up or down. It'll just be stagnant sideways. Uh, and then what's interesting is to see the, the coincident economic index, which is what is currently happening, that the indicators of what is currently happening, and that is still compounding and accelerating sequentially on a three-month annualized basis. Um, and so until the coincident indicators are heading down and below the uh, pre-COVID trend, then... I think we're still going to be getting relatively strong, uh, strong numbers, and I don't think that uh, I don't think that we have any risk of real recession anytime soon. So I wanted to call that out. And then speaking of recession, check these are the NBER indicators. You have uh, the payrolls on the left and total employed on the le uh, in the next set of bars, and then also industrial production, retail sales, wholesale, real personal income, X transfer, and real PCE. Uh, and these are all, uh, other than uh, real personal income X transfer, they're all trending on a sequential compounding basis in the wrong direction. Uh, and then obviously your uh, employed, your payrolls indicators, um, those are also a, either trending the wrong direction in the case of the household survey or just well above average, uh, well above the pre-COVID trend. Um, so. I just want to call that out as well. So we're not currently in recession, uh, and it doesn't look like anything that the NBER would classify as recession anytime soon. Um, I think that that is still to come uh, later this year. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, call this quits. Um, again, my call right now is a correction. I don't think I'm alone in that, and I don't think I was you know, original and or the first person to call that. But everything that I'm seeing suggests a correction is near um, or is impending. Uh, and so I expect that correction to uh, carry into uh, that that it has started this week uh, and that it's going to carry into the next few weeks. And on, on a, uh, I would say, a three to five week time horizon, I would say that in all likelihood, um, let me go back to this chart. I expect price to at least make it down to sub 4000 on the S&P and to around 24000 on Bitcoin before the correction is over. And then we'll see where all the numbers are at by then. By the time that all takes place, I expect that the FOMC meeting will have come uh, and that we'll have non-farm payrolls and perhaps even CPI. Uh, so just be careful. Uh, make sure you're hedging. Make sure you're managing your risk. And with that, I will leave you and I'll see you guys next time.